Way to go, church. It's exciting to be a part of a community that uh, really desires to be out in the community and making a difference in the community and not just what happens inside these walls. And so I just want to say congratulations. Um, You guys worked hard. It's awesome to do that. And last year we did one of these. This year our goal is to do two and build upon that. So as Curtis said, uh, we're looking to do another even bigger one in the fall. And so if there is somebody that you feel like, oh, I could nominate them for us to help out, whether it's a, a neighbor, a coworker, uh, some sort of uh, government work or school system that we could participate with, we want to invite you to help resource us in resourcing projects into our community. Or if you've got an interest in, uh, interest in helping maybe lead a project and, and taking on a little bit more responsibility, we want to invite you out to guest services Uh, after the service, just to put your name down and continue to foster a heart in our church of serving outside of our walls, of getting into the community and showing them that what we're going to talk about today makes a huge difference, not just in here, but out there. And so, way to go. Today, we are going to kind of split you into two different groups of people. I'm aware that in this space of Easter, there are some people that the first 15, 20 minutes of the service has been like an exciting expression for you. You're singing these worship songs. You're believing that, the, uh, that Jesus is resurrected from the grave. You're excited about making that statement that today has a, has a significant impact on your life because you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And you're like, yes, the first part of the service was great. I loved it. And then there's a group of people here. Who are like, that first part of the service was weird. Like, why are you singing and joyful about this thing that's going on? And maybe you're here because a parent or a friend, a neighbor invited you, and you're like, as soon as this service can get over with, like, let's get to Easter meal and stuff. Right now, those of you that loved singing worship songs, you had your time. This time is for those that are sitting here that maybe you're, you're doubting, maybe you're skeptical, maybe you're thinking this whole Jesus thing is a stupid, stupid joke, and I'm an idiot. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. It's good to have you. And the next 20 minutes or so, I want to help us navigate what it looks like to interact with God and interact with this thing that we hear people singing about and these Christians that say that there's this resurrected Jesus and what difference does it really make? And so I'm going to pray for us and then we'll dive in to this little thing we call Christianity. Let's pray. God, uh, I, I ask for those that are, that are in this place that have walked away from following you or frankly they just disdain you. They don't like you at all or they think you're a made-up character, or whatever. God, whatever it is that you have got them into this space to hear the good news, I pray by your Spirit's power that you speak through me and that you stir hearts to say yes to you for the glory of you and the reality of what you have to offer. In Jesus' name, amen. To start off, I want to share with you a picture of my youngest daughter. This is Adeline. And, oh man, and this is, this is, as you can see, this is at bedtime. Now, for the Frozy family, the most unholy hour of the day is bedtime. For some reason, kids take like 45 minutes to do what should be done in two minutes. And so oftentimes, I, by the time the kids are in bed, am quite frustrated. I've probably yelled a couple times, I've asked a million times, why are you still brushing your teeth and you don't have any toothpaste on there? Part of my ritual is at the end of the night, right before they go to bed, I go around and I give my kids a hug and kiss and I say goodnight. Adeline has started on her own a tradition in which when I come to her bed, she wraps her her little arms around my neck, and she gently pulls me in to give me a kiss. But Adeline's thing is that she doesn't kiss me on the lips. 
she kisses me square on the forehead. And if I go in for a kiss on the lips, she puts her hand on the back of my head and tilts it forward so that she can give me a kiss on the forehead. In that moment, the world is right. All the tension and frustration that I've just experienced with her, mostly her, all the things that just minutes ago I was frustrated with, all the worries of the day, in that moment of a little daughter's kiss on her father's forehead, the world is right, and I want to stay in that moment. But there's also something very wrong about that moment. And the very wrongness of that moment is the reality that soon that moment will end. Soon I'll go back to the tensions and worries of life, the frustrations with my kids. There's something wrong in that way too quickly, way too quickly, She's going to be 13. She's going to be 27. Way too quickly, there's going to be a day where I will be laying in a bed and I will draw my daughter's head to me and I will kiss her for the last time. As you sit in that reality, your soul is stirring with truth. The emotions that you're feeling, the tension that you're feeling about the rightness of that moment, the rightness of that father-daughter interaction of love where the heart is connected in a way where peace is in there is also held with this tension of it being wrong because it has to come to an end. And your soul stirs. Perhaps you don't connect with that story. Perhaps this is better. Perhaps two weeks ago when Virginia won the NCAA championship. You, yeah, there we go. You know. Your heart stirred in a way that you were anticipating for maybe years, maybe decades, and maybe only just a couple hours. But in the time where they sunk that three-pointer, where they went in the lead, there was something that happened to your soul that was more than emotion, where you, you sat on the edge of your seat, you cheered, you yelled, you screamed, you were so excited, or if you were on the other team, the other end. Anger and feelings. But in that moment, there was this sense of just elation where you're like, they finally won the championship. My team won, and you were so excited. And then you woke up the next day, and yes, they were still champions, but that sense of what was in that moment so good and pure and exciting was now a little bit less. Maybe that's not for you. Maybe sports don't interest you. How about food? Where were you when you ate the greatest steak in your life? Some of you don't eat meat. Let me just pray for you right now. And No, just kidding. <laughs> but I remember where I was. I was in Hawaii, and I was at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm a quick eater. I think I ate an eight-ounce filet in about an hour. I savored every delicious, perfectly cooked, buttery goodness. <laughs> that in that moment, there was something that, that, my, that my tongue screamed at me, oh my goodness, this is good. Take your time. Enjoy it. Oh, and in that depth of even that flavor of the steak, there was something that stirred my soul, and yet dinner came to an end. Maybe that's still not you. Perhaps it's a musical score. For me, when I hear the score of Apollo 13, ooh, there's something that goes on that's beyond emotions but stirs to beauty, stirs to tension, stirs to the reality of a story that I'm in. It sings, it sings to my soul in a way where I, I'm held breathless at moments by the sound of the orchestra gaining momentum, and that too comes to an end. There's a rightness in each one of these things that I would say we have to pay attention to people. There's a beauty in each one of these things, and so much more 
that draws us to something beyond ourselves. Because at some point in time, they end, and we know we're left with the longing that's still there. C.S. Lewis said this about all of life's desires. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, steak, championship, music, a daughter's kiss. If we find ourselves in, uh, with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Or, to put it what I believe more properly, perhaps we were made for a world grander than this. For a relationship more significant than this. But what we can do, and we have the options to do this, we can look at these things that, that stir our soul, whether it's in joy or deep, deep despair, and we can just say, it is what it is. There is no God. You have the right to say that. But I think that your, the stirring in you calls that out as a lie. I think you know that. We live in a world that says, no, no God, no God, no God. But I think if we sit and pause and we look at these beautiful moments, there's something in our soul that goes, no, that can't be true. It's, it can't just be neural pathways shooting electrons and creating dopamine release so that we feel good about. That you're telling me that my entire interaction with my daughter in which there's a love connection of beauty and innocence and love, that it's just a chemical interaction that has absolutely no meaning. I, be I believe you and I, if we're honest with ourselves, we call that baloney. There's something deeper going on. And so if there's not no God, if there's something beyond this that's beckoning us, calling us, affirming in us this longing, we then have to ask ourselves, well then, which God? Which God is it? And for me, this is a personal statement in which I, I journeyed into that question when I was in high school. I said, uh, there's got to be this God, but what is the true God? And I began to look at history and apologetics and philosophy and not just the Bible, but things outside the Bible. And I was like, whoa, it's so clearly Jesus Christ. That when we look at all the other gods, all the other options, we're drawn to the presence of a God that affirms the stirring in your souls in a positive way, but also affirms those times of deep despair with the reality that he did something about that. I want to take a look at a verse really quick. Actually, to put it properly, it's a letter written to an early church by a guy who hated Christianity. There's this guy named Paul, and this, this conversation started arising in in the society that he was part of, of this guy named Jesus who, who rose from the dead, who offered life, both life eternal and a joy-filled life right now. And Paul was dead set on silencing those morons that talked about a risen Jesus. This was his goal. This was his desire. How can I silence the movement of Christianity? Something happened to him. And listen to what he writes right here. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This man hated the idea of a risen Christ. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. That he was buried and that he rose on the third day in accordance with Scripture. This is a wild statement, and that he appeared to Kephas, however you want to say that, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. In other words, you doubt this, go talk to people. Go talk to those people who are also saying they saw a risen Christ. Then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. And then to all the apostles, last of all, to the one untimely born, this is himself, he appeared also to me. There is a claim that Paul is making, which is in starch opposition 
staunch opposition to what he said pri previously, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so if there is a God, and if the best explanation is Jesus Christ, what then do we do with the figure and the person of Jesus Christ? Well, once again, we have options. You have options. One of the options is you can say, oh, you know, I, I believe there was a historical figure of Jesus, but uh, he was kind of like a good, like, moral teacher. He was a nice, nice enough guy. And yeah, a lot of the stuff that, that I've heard he said is good stuff, and we should, we should kind of follow his morals, but not, we shouldn't call him Lord. We shouldn't, we shouldn't devote our lives to him. We shouldn't believe that he rose from the dead. That's ridiculous. Well, I would submit to you that, in fact, that definition of Jesus is ridiculous. Because there are things that Jesus claimed to be that puts him out of the category of a moral teacher. Jesus claimed in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. I and God are one. This is not just one area. This is multiple areas where Jesus claims that he is God. That him and God are one. Jesus also makes his weird claim that he is going to die and raised from the dead. Jesus also makes these claims that what he's going to do will pay the penalty for everybody. If he is a good moral teacher, and then he claims to be God, and claims to do these things that, well, he, he ended up dying. He didn't really come back to the, from the dead. He is a liar, and he is a lunatic. Listen, some of you are sitting here, and you're saying, wow, um, well, maybe you're saying, uh, Drew, he's a, he's a really good teacher. What? He probably presents some really good morals. And maybe I'm interested in being part of the church. Well, if at some point in time during my teaching I say, hey, let me just pause right there, and let me just be really clear with you. I am God. Now, don't take this out of context. Don't sound bite that, because I am not. But you would then rightfully say, I am gone. I'm out of here. That guy's nuts. He thinks he's God. And all the morality that I teach would just be excused because the lunacy, and if I claimed even more like I was going to die and raise from the dead, when I didn't raise from the dead, you would be like, I can't count on anything this guy says. Rightfully so. So we cannot say, we cannot say that Jesus was a great moral teacher with the claims that he made. He'd be a lunatic and a liar. Well, what's the other option? Well, the other option is this. We can say he's a legend. It was a legend. You know, a lot of disciples, a lot of the people that were following Jesus, they had a lot invested in him. And they're like, oh, you're going to do great things. Okay, you're going you're gonna to conquer. All right, great. And then they saw him on the cross, and they're like, oh, no. Oh, no. Our plan is ruined. He's dead. What do we do? I've got an idea. What if we tell everybody he raised from the dead? Now, with the authority of Jesus Christ, we'd say, wow, that's a great idea. The problem is this, that for their legend, each disciple, besides Judas, who, well, he's Judas, was murdered, beaten, or exiled for their claim to what Jesus did. If you're going to make up a legend, you're going to make up a legend that benefits you. And if you make up a legend in which Jesus raises from the dead and you think, oh, this is really going to position us well. We're going to do great. And then people are like, actually, we're going to kill you. We're going to beat you if you hold on to this. Any normal person would say, okay, just made that up. No, it's good. It was totally fake. And yet, to a person, not him, but other people, were told in the midst of flogging, beating, whipping, scorning, being set on fire alive, Say that Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Tell us it's a legend. And they said, I have seen him. I saw the risen Christ. So is it likely that it's a legend? No. Therefore, what other option do we have? I would submit that the greatest option left to us is the greatest answer that we are looking for, which is that he is actually Lord. That Jesus is who he claims he is. That Jesus is God. That Jesus died. And unbelievably, 
didn't stay that way. We don't have the option, really, of saying he's a good moral teacher. You can call him a lunatic and liar. You can say it's a legend, and you can go on your way, or you can see the reality of who he is and decide to follow him. So, what does that mean? What does that mean within the midst of these stories, in the midst of how we interact with God? Number one is if you have not decided in your heart, if you have not confessed with your mouth, as Romans 10 says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is who he says he is, I want to encourage you, I want to implore you, I want to just cheer you on to say yes to following Jesus. This is significant not just for where we end up when we die. It's significant for now. I'm going to explain that in a second. But before I do that, there's two other challenges. Number one, follow Jesus if you haven't. That's confessing to him. Say, I believe in the work of the cross. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I want to start orienting my life to what he's called me to do. Number two, some of you are not ready to do that. You're like, eh, I, don't, I still got a lot of questions. Well, join the team. We're a room full of question askers, and I still have questions. But I want to I wanna just beg you, don't stop having conversation. Continue the conversation. It's okay to not be there yet. I would say it's not okay just to be like, okay, I did my Easter time, I'm out. If something is stirring on your heart, continue to have conversations. If you know somebody who's a Christian, just say, hey, can we talk about this? This seems really weird. Yeah, it's weird. There's a guy that claims to be God who then rose from the dead. We admit it's weird. But don't stop having conversations. Continue that. And lastly, I would encourage you, each and every one of you, come back. Join us next week. Come back to learn more. We're in a series about the Holy Spirit, which is God's Spirit placed on those who believe Him and the work that He can do. It's amazing. Join us next week. We'd love to have you as we continue this. We're really just exploring stuff together and figuring this out. We don't all have it together. We don't all know everything. None of us knows everything. You can be part of that. But we're looking to see more and more of our lives reflect Jesus. So, in all that, what does this mean? What is the importance? What is the importance of all this in terms of daddy-daughter kisses, steaks, championships, music, art, beauty, things that stir in our soul. So often, it's believed that this whole organization of Christianity is only there to save us from hell. As if our whole goal is just to get you to cross the line so you don't have to go to hell. That is far short of the picture that God wants for your life. The beauty of following Jesus, and I say this as somebody who interacts with his beautiful daughter and gets to receive that with God in a realization that this kiss on my forehead is a gift from the Father that points to something greater. That it is not just this moment that fleets and I'll write it down somewhere and remember it someday. But that there's an element of that that I can hold on to for eternity. Knowing that, it, knowing that someday every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. That joy will be made complete. That the experience that I get and the love that I feel for my precious little girl in that moment is something to be experienced even more richly and fully and more flavored both now in the gift of God and in eternity. That the championship of Virginia and the excitement that stirred is not just a moment of following a team and saying, yay, we scored more points than the other team, but that in fact it's a spiritual interaction where God is speaking to you. Can, you. can you picture this? That that's actually the voice of God that's saying, hey, you know the goodness of that. You know that that is what I want for you. That is the interaction of a life with me. That I am standing with you and I'm cheering with you to say, this 
shows us something more. Following Jesus flavors everything in a more delicious and amazing way. It's not just saving us from hell, it's saving us for the goodness and the flavors of life. And here's the beauty of our God. It's not just in the high times and the good times and the glad times and the yay times. It's also in the desperate, sad, broken times that in that, when we cry our deepest tears, when we yell at God for the wrongness of the world, he says, I know, and I've done something about it. I've sent my son to the cross to die for that disgusting thing that death has brought on, that sin has brought on, and I sit with you, and without me, all that is is your trouble and your pain and get on with life, but with me, trust me, it doesn't end in death. I have done something about it. My son gave his life for that pain that you're in. My, ga- my son gave his life for that joy that you're in so that you can have life and life to the fullest. Following Jesus, celebrating Easter, is not just about where we go when we die. It is, in fact, about how we live now and for eternity. Church, may we see the interactions with our daughters and our sons with our friends and our family, with our food and with our sports, with our music and the art, with the comfort of the pillow, with that blanket that's just perfectly warm in the winter, as echoes of God's voice mm, calling to something so much greater in a life with him. Let's pray.